Nitesh. Hi. So, welcome on a rainy day. <laughs> I'm finally happy that the rains are here at least. So, yeah, delving into the feminine, as you said, where are we in the feminine? Well, it's the feminine is in us, in all of us, regardless of who we are. So, today we will be speaking uh, about the four stages of anima development. This was something that we briefly touched upon in the first uh, part of the series and we wanted to delve a little deeper into that aspect today. So, we, we started off with speaking about what is the anima and the animus and uh, it's uh, the concept was coined by Freud and later Carl Jung, uh, primarily Carl Jung, who said that the, there is a masculine in the feminine so, as a woman, I would have a masculine side and as a man, you would have a feminine side. And th that is regardless of what the biological sex happens to. All of us have carry a balance of the genders and we may or may not exhibit or choose to exhibit those aspects of the genders depending on how we are conditioned. So, sometimes society teaches us to not exhibit a certain aspect of the gender that you don't biologically belong to. Uh, however, psychologically any kind of a suppression in that regard is is unhealthy and it very, le very likely leads to violence I in some form or the other. It, it may not necessarily be violence in the terrorist form of it, but it, violence towards self or uh, self-sabotage, sometimes physical and emotional violence. So we spoke about what the role of the anima is and that that's something that's considered extremely critical in psychology. Uh, not so much the animus, but the role of the anima. Anima is the feminine in the man. And while uh, Carl Jung defined anima as this very narrow thing of the feminine in the man, uh, my experience with the anima is it's also about the feminine in the woman. It's as much of that, given that a lot of us, given the current world that we are brought up in, most of us as women also get brought up in a very masculine way. Right? So we, we taught to be out in the world, to compete, to provide, to to do everything yeah, that. Modern yeah. So in that sense, I wouldn't really restrict uh, the anima as the feminine in the man. It's as much for a woman as for a man given that we are not really donning the typical feminine role anyway. So, we, from there we spoke about the heroine's journey and how, how the, the monomyth as it's called came to be formed about how in the human journey there seems to be a pattern for everybody whether it's a huge hero or a dictator or a common person on the street there is a certain pattern to the journey that everyone seems to be moving towards. And the last time we spoke about the gender spectrum and more importantly the, the need to expand our idea of gender and allow ourselves to be all genders that we can be. Right? Uh, because we are traditionally taught that you are you're either man or woman, you are boy or girl and therefore you have to be at one end of the spectrum. Psychologically we are not geared to be at one end of the spectrum, we are always somewhere in between and uh, situations in life demand that we need to be able to access all ends of it. Right? So, the aspect of gender fluidity becomes very important. Uh, still today, if you look at it, gender fluidity is not a norm, it is considered an aberration. Uh, so, it would be considered an aberration if a wa man walks into this room wearing women's clothes or makeup. However, that ability to be able to embrace that aspect of one's gender becomes very important. And strangely, in the world that we live in, uh, a woman embracing a man's clothes or behavior is considered okay. For some reason, the, the other extreme is not considered okay. Right. So, we, we need to work towards more fluidity in our understanding. So, we delve back into the anima today. So, Carl Jung used to call anima the archetype of life. So, the, the term animated comes from anima. So, when you see a person is very animated in a conversation, full of life, that that is about the anima being very active. 
in the person, the, the feminine force being very active. If you have to look at a parallel concept, uh, the, so the, the Vedic scriptures speak about the Purusha and the Prakriti. So the Purusha is, the, is, is potential, it's pure potential. Prakriti is the expression of that potential. And just being Purusha doesn't really create the world. The Prakriti uses the Purusha to create the world. So the, the, that's the anima, the, the Prakriti that he speaks about. So Carl Jung again used to say that the anima, he functions in a man as his soul. So without the anima being op operant, without the feminine being operant, a, a man wouldn't have a soul, which means there is, while a person may go about life, there is a sense of lifelessness about it. It's, it's a zombie state, that there is no purpose or meaning to that life because it's just routine. So, um, it's a broad generalization when we have stages, but uh, uh, a Jungian concept where it is said that uh, the development of the feminine in a man, and I, I would personally expand that to a woman as well, goes through these stages. So, it starts from the archetype of the Eve going to Helen, to Mary, and to Sophia, which is the ultimate wisdom. So let's explore that further. So the proposition is that the, the feminine begins its expression for a man and perhaps also for a woman as the archetype of Eve. So Eve being the first mother, right? So the first mother and the nourisher and, and the creator, that, that's the archetype that you're talking about. And uh, given that Eve was the first mother, the, the function of Eve in her uh, society, so to say, was very basic. It was about giving birth, it was about protecting the child, nourishing, giving it love. Right? That, that was Eve and that, that was just her function in life. So it's very natural, it's instinctive, it, it, it's not something that needs to be taught. It, it, happens to every mother and it's very biological. The, the archetype of the Eve is very uh, driven by biological needs. So when a boy first experiences the feminine, it's typically in the archetype of Eve, the mother. Right? So as a baby boy, the, the first experience of the feminine is typically the mother or whoever is the mother figure. Right? So how is the connection with the feminine as a child? It is the connection of love, it is a connection of being fed, being nourished, being protected. So therefore the first connection is that, okay, the feminine is like this, the feminine has the quality of loving, nurturing, protecting, that, that, that's the first relationship with the feminine. Uh, now. On the one hand, yes, that there is the idea of anima development, which means while one stage exists, it is not, ideally it shouldn't exist for life because then you get stuck in, in that stage and therefore psychosocial development, economic development stalls as well. However, uh, you mean, you mean hmm? without progression of that? Yes. So it is important that the boy outgrows the Eve stage at some point in time. Typically in our social context, the outgrowing happens when there is puberty and there is that movement to the other stage. Uh, however, depending on what happens uh, in the experience with the mother or the mother figure, sometimes a person might get psychologically stuck at the eve. Right? Uh, it could happen either because there is a missing mother or there could be an overbearing mother. Both ways, the, the person gets stuck with the archetype of the eve and uh, therefore, it is said that the Eve has two aspects. There is the benevolent aspect, which is the nice nurturing aspect, but there could also be the malice aspect, the negative aspect, where, where, where the mother is perceived as somebody who is extremely controlling, overbearing, and therefore one needs to run away from. And when, if a person happens to get psychologically at the Eve stage, it's possible that 
the person might spend all his life running away from whoever looks like his mother or behaves like his mother. So uh, the entire life quest is about trying to be away from whatever is like the mother. Or the other extreme could happen. The person might grow up, get married and look for the mother and the wife or look for the mother and the that, that's again getting stuck at the Eve stage psychologically. So while these stages are very, all of these stages are nourishing at a certain point in time in life, it's important to start out growing. Okay. So the, the primary purpose for choosing this subject was to look at our own fem anima and look at what's dominant in our anima and is there some resolution needed for any stage. So it's possible that in some cases we may have moved on to other stages and yet there could be a part of Eve that is still calling for resolution. There is perhaps some relationship with the mother figure that needs to be addressed and resolved, put to rest. That also so. can happen as a retrospect, how we behave in Yes, so, uh, yes, why speak about it to somebody else, somebody else might, but yes, very often it is prospecting and figuring out what is the relationship and am I at rest in that relationship? Right? If, if there's an unsolved issue with the Eve archetype, other archetype, so then. Yes. Uh, there's no questionnaire in the sense it depends on the life story. It depends on the re individual relationship with the mother. Uh, so yes, introspection help very, very often. Uh, if you look at your relationships with the other gender, that certainly helps to see, are you looking for a mother in, in the women around you, in your sister, in your female friends, in your spouse, in your you know, female colleagues? Is, is there a need to either look for the mother or look for the anti-mother, the, the, the opposite of it? So, either ways, if you're looking for that, then the, there is something unresolved with the Eve and that needs to be put to rest. Uh, sometimes it's possible to do that by having a direct conversation with the mother figure, but sometimes just an internal resolution process to say, it's okay, I'm done with that and now move on to the other aspect. Because uh, ultimately the feminine energy is also the energy that enables our creativity, it enables productivity at work, it enables life force in that sense, it enables you to move on to what's next in life. And if it gets stuck at any stage, then there is a lot of energy that's not available for general success in life. So it becomes important to look at where am I in, in, in the development of the feminine. And it's as as important to introspect as a woman as it is for a man. So the next archetype is Helen. So uh, by Helen uh, we mean the Helen of Troy uh, as the archetype. So uh, Helen is 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 like the collective sexual image, the the archetype of the, the sexual woman, the desirable one that is held by the by men in general, but also yes, the, the wom woman holds her own sexuality through that archetype. Um, usually the Helen stage is considered a short-lived stage. Uh, typically most of us would go through that during our puberty when we suddenly become aware of the sexual energies and then it's a short-lived stage. It's also a very glamorized, glorified state and it's not very practical. <laughs> So our vision of Helen is not something that's available all around. It, it is very dreamy, right? It, it is the vision of a woman that kings fight over and they don't care about their kingdoms. They're <laughs> willing to lose their lives. Yeah, they, they kill thousands of people in the process so in the quest for Helen. Right? So a, an extremely prolonged Helen state is a very destructive state as we saw in the Trojan War, right, where no one really got anything out of that because 
somewhere an entire kingdom got stuck in that state of of the Helen, the feminine being stuck at the state of the Helen. So at, at a social level, what it would mean and what it meant then was somewhere the, the society as a whole became pro or against Helen. So one part of it was, one part of the society that was pro Helen was willing to go to war and forsake everything else in life, forsake all productivity, all regularity in life, just take of that one woman and the capture of that woman. And there was the other part of the society that was also equally stuck, but on a moralistic stance of saying, you can't be stealing somebody's wife. Either way, they were stuck with Helen. So it's not so much about pro or against, but, but about the obsession with Helen that can be extremely unproductive. And uh, still happens in societies around the world. It still happens to individuals where the quest for that one woman figure or feminine figure, it may not even be a woman, it could be a desirable man. That quest makes you forsake everything else in life and that, that becomes very impractical. The Helen stage is necessary to become aware of one's sexuality and sexual energies and integrate it and move on, but being stuck in that state becomes a very difficult one. Uh, However, yes, we see a lot of this happening even in our own society. Any society where sexuality is a taboo, there is a danger of the Helen st people getting stuck in that Helen state. And we see that even in the Indian context where a lot of rape and sexual violence happens because you're not allowed to talk about it openly or express it openly and therefore when it gets expressed, it's expressed as acid attacks on women, it's expressed as gang rape, it's expressed as violence. Yeah. So each of these stages needs to find expression in a healthy way and when it doesn't find that expression, it's, it's dangerous. Because the, the intellect may move on, the psyche doesn't move on. Right. So the, the emotional development, the psychological development doesn't really happen. Unfortunately, a lot of our education, I mean, pretty much all of our education for that matter is on the intellectual development part of it, not so much the psychological development. And, and this is something that needs to be spoken about and dealt with in an aware manner. So after the Helen comes Mary, the Mother Mary. Uh, so the Mother Mary is a build on the mother archetype, but it is beyond her. It is about raising motherhood to the level of service, to the, to the level of spiritual devotion. Uh, when the anima is in this stage, the man is capable of looking at a woman as a friend, not just as a sexual object. Because the sexuality gets integrated, the Helen stage gets integrated and processed, it finds healthy expression and therefore the possibility emerges of looking at a woman not only as a romantic partner but also perhaps as a sister, as a daughter, as a friend, as a colleague. So there are other relationships that are become possible in a healthy manner with uh, at this uh, stage. It's a stage where it, there is a very clear differentiation between what is love and what is lust and what is just a regular relationship without any of those aspects. Uh, the Mary is considered a very evolved uh, stage because it also with a fairly high degree of spiritual development, so to say, for lack of a better term, uh, in, in the sense that uh, it is said that uh, when, uh, you know, when Jesus was born and there was that need to in order to get the message across to the masses, there, there was that need ultimately in that lifetime of Jesus to, for him to get crucified and the situations had to lead to him getting crucified. Somebody had to give him away and, you know. So uh, it, it is said that the, the choice was between Judas doing it and Mother Mary doing it. And ultimately, apparently Judas took on that role of the traitor because 
it was too dangerous for Mother Mary to take on that role because the mother archetype around the world would totally crumble if the mother gave the child away as a traitor. But that is the level of devotion to say that, okay, if I have to serve the world, I can give up my child. That, that, that's the stage of the Helen. So uh, when, when you speak of integrating that state as my feminine, the feminine within me, it is about a stage of discernment, about saying that, okay, if it needs to be something for the larger good of the world, I am willing to give up something that I consider mine, something that is individual. So this is a stage where a man or a woman comes into a state of not necessarily sacrifice. It's not viewed as sacrifice in that state. It is viewed as service. It is about saying that I am in the world and I'm willing to be of service to the world for let go of whatever is my small problem addressing bigger problems in the world. Yeah. So uh, a lot of what, a lot of people that we consider saints or you know highly evolved spiritual figures are people that have integrated the Mary. Right? And therefore, they're, the, they're feminine, whether they're a man or a woman. The feminine allows them to look beyond personal needs and look at what is needed for the world. So if you look at a Mother Teresa or we look at any saintly figures that we know of, it, it, they, they are at that stage of, of integrating the Mary. Right? So <coughs> the personal needs don't matter as much as the world around matters, being in service. So the first uh, three stages, uh, the, the Eve, the Helen, and the Mary, are, the sta are stages where we see a lot of people going through in the world. It, it, it's not a transition to get into this, so long as one is aware and doesn't get psychologically stuck in, in the previous two stages. The last stage is Sophia. Sophia is, is the Latin term for wisdom. Kalyan says that, you know, in, in modern history, very few people can actually get to Sophia. That, that was his view. Uh, I don't quite agree, but yeah, it, it, it is a very... taken care of or at least it's facilitated to a good extent. Some people still get stuck but it's facilitated. Very little is done about getting to the Sophia. From the movement from Mary to Sophia is a very conscious and a very individual journey. It's not something that a social structure can support. So that state of Mary is a state where a person has sufficiently what is termed as in individuated which means I have found my place in the world. Right? So my place in the world could be reflected through professional success, through social standing, uh, having enough money, having good relationships. It could, be, it, it could be expressed in different ways for different people. But there is sufficient individuation, which means the world recognizes me for who I am and what I do. That's the individuation and therefore that individuation opens up the path to service. So it is that stage where I can say, okay, I have enough, my needs are fulfilled, now let me give back to society. That, that's the state of the very. Now moving on from there into Sophia is about getting away from that individuation and saying, okay, now I've built an identity, let me dissolve that identity. So. It's not so much about practical renunciation in terms of giving away physical things as much as saying I'm okay if I'm not recognized for my work anymore, I'm okay if I'm not seen anymore, but I still want to serve. Uh, leaving uh, your ego? Yes, it is the dissolution of the ego, not so much the possessions. It is, uh, to, to a certain degree, uh, the uh, Vrithashram, uh, no, not the Vrithashram, what is it? Uh, one 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 yeah. the, the, that one state is, yeah, that state is the uh, Sophia state. Moving away from the Grihastashram into the Vanaprasthashram. That, that's the Sophia state. 
and uh, yeah, in a way, yeah, Kalyan is right when he says that in the modern times, very few people actually ah, get to that yeah, state. Time, yeah. Because uh, till the very state, we have a social function around, social system around it, but no one really gives away and then it dissolves the ego after that. So, Sophia is about the, the feminine as the Sophia is the guide to the inner life. It's about saying, okay, I've done my bit in the world, I've done my bit for the world, now back to me and can I be one with the world? Okay. I don't need to be one as individual anymore, can I be one in the bigger sense of the term. So, the, the Sophia brings up everything from the unconscious into the conscious, which means the Sophia state is where one is okay with saying, okay, there is there are sides of me that I have not discovered in my journey to individuation. Right? So that, that there are maybe dark sides of me. Maybe I was a very successful businessman, but I know there is a murderer in me lurking somewhere. I have not murdered somebody in my life, but I'm still capable and I, it's important that I integrate that into me. Not necessarily by going out and murdering somebody, but accepting that I can be that too. I happen to be a successful businessman. I could have been a murderer and that's okay too. So bringing in everything from the unconscious into the conscious. And the unconscious could also have some very powerful positive things. Right? So maybe I led a successful life, but I led a life where I was um, scared of, let's say, scared of showing off my power. The power could have been in the shadow, it could have been in the unconscious and that also needs to get claimed when the Sophia is alive, when the Sophia is active to say that yes, I am powerful and that's okay too. Humility is not necessarily needed, it's not necessarily a virtue. So the, the Sophia brings up polarities. So whatever individuation I have built, whatever identity I have built, the Sophia brings up the parallel, the polarity to say while you are this, you could have also been this and integrate that. And integration is a matter of saying, yeah, that's also possible and, and, and I'm okay with that being possible. That, that's the integration. Uh, the Sophia state pushes one to the search for meaning. To say what's what's more in life, why am I alive? Why, why was I born? What's my purpose? Like, that's the Sophia enabling. The, the quest. So this is a conscious journey, this is a very individual journey. So in that sense, yeah, till Mary, most of us stumble through in life and get there. But that journey from Mary to Sophia to, to, to wisdom, from service to wisdom about saying all is one, one and all is okay. Right? All polarities are okay. And whether I exist or not is okay. Mm -hmm. the, the, that state is is the state of the Sophia. So that's uh, that's a very interesting part of the journey. I, I find the archetype of the Sophia very fascinating. So that's uh, the stages of animal development. Uh, so usually, as I said. Normally when the possibilities of one stage are exhausted, you move on to the next stage. Our social system is also constructed around that. So you you get done with your basic needs for nourishment and love and protection and all that. You move on to, to the hell and from there you move on to the Mary. So that, that, that gets facilitated usually that, that, that except for the final stage which is a very conscious process. That, that comes out of choice. Uh, usually the movement from one state to another is normally preceded by some kind of a crisis. Right? It could usually be, uh, in some cases it expresses itself as this midlife crisis where people start questioning what am I doing in life, why am I here. It could be the crisis that most teenagers would have around puberty to, you know, that, that struggle of saying am I a child, am I adult, where am I, why, what am I doing. Right? So typically each of these stages starts with some kind of a crisis. The Eve stage starts with the crisis of the birth. Mm -hmm. And the birth as a very difficult process for the baby. Right? 
indicates that the passing through that tunnel is a huge task for the baby. So most of these are, unless it's a very conscious journey, every stage has a crisis around it. Uh, the pitfalls of the, the whole stages, as we said, is there is very much a possibility of being captured by the anima in one stage. So you may get captured by the Eve or captured by the Helen and then get stuck. And when you're stuck there, then it's, it's a difficult journey to move on. And uh, the most challenging part about it is very often it doesn't reflect in the social status or the social, what you do in society. So you may carry on as a professional, as a family person, and yet be psychologically stuck and therefore there is that dissatisfaction in relationship. Yeah. There is one part uh, sometimes it may yeah. appear. Yes. So you will find sometimes a lot of marriages end on that note where one person says, you know, I was never treated as a wife, I was treated as a mother or yeah. you know, I was treated as the bad mother or any of that. And th th that is where the person is stuck. The person is captured by the animal at one stage. So while he may have physically moved on and therefore established a profession, been successful and all of that, the psyche is still somewhere inside. So, yeah, the, the purpose of this uh, talk is to look at can we in some way educate ourselves and educate others around us to say be conscious of this development and not get stuck. Yeah. Our, yeah. Be in the flu. Yes. And uh, a lot of times people don't know when they are stuck. Ah, yes. And it's important to bring that to their notice to say, this is who you're looking for now. Stop looking for it. You're no longer there in your life. So, no longer there in your physical life, and therefore the psychological life also needs to grow up with it. Uh, but yeah, ultimately the presence of the anima is, is in service of of life in service of the masculine, if you're talking of it in the context of the man, it, it lends life meaning, it, it it enables access to the unconscious and therefore bigger, in, a greater integration and a, and a huge sense of expansion energetically, psychically and spiritually. So, yeah, it's something that needs to be very consciously tapped. But sometime in society you feel two, three type of character, uh, like people sometimes uh, feel that I don't need you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm independent. I mean, whatever. I mean, your family member or your friends and all this. Mm -hmm. The attitude is, mm -hmm. I don't need you. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. in any this thing, it is my I don't need you. Yeah. Or sometimes you feel, uh, I want to experience me through you. Mm -hmm with the various this thing. Yes. So, does some kind of, uh, I mean... See, the I don't need you is usually about the denial of the ah. Eve. Ah. Right? Because my mother was not there when I needed her. Right. I'm going to play that game and say I'm, I'm, I'm not going to need anybody else in life because the dependency causes pain. Okay. Right? As a child I needed the mother in oh. whatever form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it could have been one-off instance that triggers it where you know, the child was hurt alone and the mother was traveling or something and, and that could be a point of getting stuck. Yeah. Right? And it's important to release so that, that and not carry on that so drama, you know, all through life because once you're stuck then the pattern starts building. Then every relationship I get into, my stance is going to be that, okay, I'm in a relationship but I'm not going to acknowledge my need for you because hmm. once I say I'm dependent on you in any form, I am vulnerable to pain. You have the power to hurt me and I'm not going to give you the power. Then the game starts. And then no matter what you accomplish in life, the, the psyche is still stuck at that. The, the, the denial of the game. Or the, uh, for, you know, a lot of uh, spiritual practices look at austerity uh, as a celibacy, as, mm. as a practice. Again, a huge denial of the Helen. Oh. Yes. And which is... Ah, specifically, I mean, we should not say, but in Jains. A, a lot of, I mean, you look at a lot of Christian monasteries where ah, the, 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 there is sodomy happening, yes. a lot of Buddhist monasteries where that's yes. happening. 
Uh, celibacy is not a natural state. It's okay to accept and integrate that and say, okay, as humans we procreate through sexuality, so we are sexual beings yeah. and that's okay. It's a natural process. Yes. Natural process. The, the drive may be different for different people, but right. to integrate and say it is all right to be a sexual being is important because the denial of the Helen is in terms of saying, no, it's not allowed to be sexual. Mm -hmm. You cannot have sexual thoughts or feelings or desires and okay. then the psyche is stuck and then there is violence in other forms and because because the violence usually if you look at uh, religious orders the violence is contained within that order yes. Yes. it becomes extremely difficult within for people around there yes. so it is important to consciously pace through all those four stages. In any structural violence where you say something is not permitted, mm -hmm. it becomes a huge issue. Okay. Yes. So that's that for me today. Thank you. Thank you.